hunting for that button. <laughs> Hey, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Great. So I first want to thank uh, Sarah and Adam for hosting and everyone else for joining today. Uh, my name is Eduardo Blancas, and uh, I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on uh, for almost one year, uh, Plumber, which is an open source library for data science. So let's start with some motivation, some background for why I started working on this project. And well, let's start speaking about data science. Uh, data science is an iterative process, right? We don't start a data science or a machine learning project knowing exactly what we are going to do. It's not like we have step one, step two, and we follow that recipe. We have to experiment. We may have some idea of the data that we should be using and how we should be using that data. Uh, but it's really trying just a bunch of different things until we get something that we like. Uh, and you experiment, so this means that the more experiments we try, the higher the chance of success, because it, it just means that we are trying more, more things. And I believe that this fact that data science is an experimental process lets, has um, given a lot of success to interactive tools like Jupyter. Because Jupyter, when we start a Jupyter notebook or, or we use J Jupyter Lab, we have some like small piece of code, press enter and we get immediate feedback. So in instead of thinking in terms of how do I get from point A to point B, we go step by step and get some feedback and then maybe tweak a few things and that's how we get um, the results that, that we want. So I think this, this, these two things really set the, like the ideas that I want, I want to convey. So data science is an experimental process and interactive tools are, are great for developing these, these types of uh, projects. And how do we do that usually? Well, if we want to get some immediate feedback, we want to work with Jupyter Notebooks and we are starting a new data science or machine learning project. We just open Jupyter Notebooks, create a, a, a new notebook and start coding. And maybe we load some data, we apply some transformations and we start adding more and more cells, more and more code until we start to make sense of some things. Maybe we understand the data set better or maybe we even start fitting a model. What's the problem? That these types of notebooks grow organically and it, they are not maintainable. We may have a notebook that has uh, hundreds if not thousands of cells if we are working on a complex project. And it's kind of hard to understand even, if, even for the person who is working on the project, it's hard to read from a start to finish what's the flow and, and which are the operations and the logic behind the, the, all the project. There are no clear boundaries. We just have a bunch of cells, uh, um, one after another. And this may also lead to other technical issues. Like maybe we have a dozen so dozens of features and we didn't anticipate that we are reusing the same names. Um, and we may end up in like really strange situations where some code that we wrote uh, 100 cells above is affecting the code that we are uh, interacting with right now. So this organic process that we follow creates a lot of difficulties. It's, it's convenient because you just open a notebook and start working on it, but it, it, it's not maintainable in the long uh, run. So why should we bother about maintainability? It, when we hear maintainability, we may think that it's something that we should worry until we release and we deploy the project that we are working on. But really maintainability help us when we are developing the project from, from day one, if we have a maintainable project, it's gonna be easier for us to just make some changes today, come back tomorrow and don't spend half of the day trying to understand what we did the day before. And I think this, this quote from Patrick Ball really summarizes well what I want to convey about maintainability. Without a lot of structure, we forget what we've done in the past. We can't read each other's work and we can't test whether what we've done is correct. So I think the, the message here is that we should focus and, and we should worry about maintainability even when we are, are starting a project, even if it's a simple one. What's the solution? If, if we want uh, maintainability, we want to structure our projects, we usually build a data pipeline, which is breaking down the big notebook that we have in smaller tasks. And instead of having just a thousand cells, we say we are gonna have a task which gets, uh, this is just an example, get users data and maybe actions performed by those users. 
then we clean those data sets and at the end we train a model. So we are giving some structure and even this structure alone is uh, helping us to communicate our thought process and what we want to do with the data. And the basic idea of a data pipeline is that the output from some task becomes the input for the next set of tasks. For example, here we are getting users data and the output from here becomes the input for the cleaning step. And the same applies for the rest of the pipeline. So now we solve a problem. We solve this problem of not having a structure, but we, all of a sudden we create new problems. So now we have to manage multiple files because uh, potentially each, each of these tasks are different files or there might be, there could be different functions. Uh, the second problem is that we have to route outputs to the right places, right? We, we have to make sure that the output from here becomes the input for this task and not for, for any other task that uh, is not using that input. And finally, we have to orchestrate execution because we have to run this in, in, a, in a specific order. And what's the answer for this problem? How do we ensure that we are able to do this structured process? Well, there are a set of tools called, uh, called workflow managers. And we have really lots of options here. Uh, perhaps the, well, uh, the most well-known tool here is Apache Airflow. We also have Luigi, Kubeflow, and there's really dozens of these options. When I started working in Plumber, I noticed that there's a common trend among these tools. And one of the most uh, obvious for me was that I had to spend a lot of time in learning a new tool. I remember a few years ago, I tried to work with Airflow and I felt like I was spending more time trying to get Airflow to work than actually getting uh, my work done, which was analyzing some data. And I think this is true for all, all tools. You have, to, you have some learning curve, but I feel like we should, we should do better in terms of having data scientists really focus on analysis and not like spending time configuring some uh, complicated infrastructure or servers. The second problem is that we have to write a lot of pipeline code, which, is, which isn't code that performs any kind of analysis. It's just the code that you need to turn your notebook into a pipeline. And more code means more problems. So the less code you write, the better. And finally, it adds unnecessary complexity because some of these tools require you to have like some other systems. For example, for Kubeflow, you have to run these on Kubernetes. And if I'm just analyzing, let's say one gigabyte of data, well, that doesn't sound like I should be worrying about those, those kind of things at, at this point. And um, I think we should remove all those barriers and have a really simple tool that allows us to focus on, on the development process. And if you're interested in a detailed comparison of uh, these workflow managers with Plumber, you can check out the blog. And I have a really detailed post analyzing what are the pros and cons of each of uh, the most popular tools. So now let's talk about Plumber. Plumber is a workflow manager that adheres to a convention of a configuration philosophy. And this, this idea was popularized by Ruby on Rails for people who, who don't know Ruby on Rails, it's a web framework. And the basic idea is that if you follow certain rules, you avoid having to write a lot of code. So what are the, the rules in, in Plumber? Each task is a function or a script. Tasks declare dependencies via an upstream variable and outputs are declared by, via a product variable. That's it. Once you know these three conventions, uh, you don't have to spend like a whole week trying to understand how, to, how Plumber works. So now I'm gonna show a demo. So on the left side, I have a, a pipeline YAML file, which is how you build a pipeline in Plumber. There's actually a Python API which gives you more flexibility, but I believe that for most projects, just having uh, the YAML file is, is just fine. So uh, the first section, uh, which I'm highlighting are just settings. So I'm gonna speak the, uh, skip the details for now. So let's focus on the second section, the tasks. Uh, really the only two things required to declare, declare a task are source, which is the source code that you are going to be using for the task and the product, which is the output that this task is going to generate. So for this simple pipeline, we only have four tasks and three of them, the first, uh, the first three are functions. And the last one is a script. So I'm gonna explain why we may want to do a script or a function uh, later on. Uh, for now, let's focus on the first task. So what I'm saying here is that my first task is a function declared in the tasks module uh, and the function has the name get. So let's open that file and actually let's put this side by side. 
um, let's create. Okay, so you can see that I have a get, which is here, features, which is here, and join, which is here. So they map one to one to each other. And let's now take a look at the source code for, for get. Uh, it's, it's really just a simple function. It doesn't have anything particularly interesting, except it follows this convention that you have a product parameter. So when Bloomberg executes this pipeline, it's gonna pass this parameter to this function. And this, this uh, function is just getting some data and saving it to, this, um, to a certain location. Now let's move to the next task, which is features. We get the data and then we generate features. This task needs some input data and it, it's gonna use the output from the previous task, which is get. So how do we do that? How do we tell to Plumber that we want to use a previous task as an input? All we have to do is to declare a new parameter called offstream. And then we just use them as if they had something on it. Like we just say, give me the output from the task get. So what's going to happen uh, under the hood is that Plumber, Plumber is going to analyze the code and say, well, you are telling me that your task features depends on get. So I'm gonna give you here the output of get, which is this one. And this not only determines the input for these functions, but also the order, because you have to execute get first and then features. Same logic for join. We are saying we are going to use the output of get and features we are gonna join in a single data frame and then we save it. So that's, that's all uh, being taken care of by Plumber, the order of execution and routing outputs to the next tasks. And these are the first three tasks. So as I mentioned before, we have one task, which is a script. And I'm gonna show the source code. Um, so what's the difference? In the, in the first three cases, we have just a function that does some um, data manipulation and it saves an output. In some cases, we, we are not only, um, we want to perform some data manipulation, but we are also interested in having some visual feed, feedback, like some tables or some charts. For example, if we are training a model, we are not only interested in saving the model, but also printing some metrics or uh, like to, to see how the model is doing. We usually do this with notebooks because the IPy and B format is able to hold tables and charts in a single file, which is very convenient. Unfortunately, Jupyter notebooks are not good for uh, version control because they are JSON files. So if you modify a notebook and push to version control, then you pull, it's really messy uh, to get the difference between the previous version and the new version. So what do we do in Plumber? We treat scripts as notebooks. So you are coding a script that when you run the pipeline, it's gonna be converted to a notebook. So you don't have to worry about saving your tables or your charts in a different file because this is going to become a notebook at some point. So you are going to see uh, the tables and everything. So I'm gonna show that now. Um, so that, that, that takes care of the first part. We have three functions and one script that becomes a notebook. So now if you take a look at the right side of the screen, I'm gonna run Plumber, actually Plumber status first. This is going to give us a, a summary of the pipeline. And this is also a great way to communicate to someone else. Uh, actually, you cannot see it. Uh, let's try again. It's because the, the text is, is so large that it's kind of hard to read. Okay. So we have, uh, we have a quick summary of the pipeline. We see the four uh, tasks. When it, it hasn't been run, if it's outdated, uh, where's the output location? And it, uh, we also extract the doc string and this helps um, you to explain what your pipeline is doing and just to give a, a brief summary. Now, if we run Plumber, and actually I'm gonna show that I'm in the right uh, folder. So we see the pipeline jaml here and the task, tasks by uh, source code. So let's run Plumber build. And this is gonna start executing in the right order. So it's running get first, then sh it should run features, then join, and finally fit. So it's still running. At this point is running the notebook. So now let's open the output. So we have a bunch of files. These files are generated by, uh, by our tasks and I'm gonna show the notebook. So we have this fit script whose output is this notebook. 
right? So you can see here that it's the same thing. And we have this confusion matrix and we have this table and we don't have to worry about saving in a different file or losing the image because it's all here in, in the same file. So this is very convenient. So this is the basic idea. And one important thing about Plumber is that it keeps track of source code changes. And this is very important because if, if I'm working on this pipeline, I may change, um, maybe I just wanna change something in the fit script. And if I modify something, I'm just gonna add one plus one here. I shouldn't be running the rest of the tasks, right? Because they, they didn't change. So what's the point? So all I have to do is run Plumber build again. And, and it's gonna notice that most of the tasks haven't changed. So you see it's directly running fit. And when you have those sense of tasks, this, this is very convenient because you don't have to think in terms of, well, if I modify this, what should I modify? What should I run? It, it's just automatic. Uh, another important thing is uh, the integration with Jupyter. Uh, so I'm going to open Jupyter Notebook. It's true that I could just modify this script and make some adjustments, but really I, I feel like having access to a Jupyter Notebook is great for incremental changes. Uh, this is not the file that I wanted to open, fit, yes. So as you can see, when I open uh, the fit Pi script, it renders as a notebook. And we are using a package called Jupytext, which performs the conversion between a script and a notebook for, for us. And you can see one extra cell. This is done by Plumber. Since we are saying this script depends on the output of join, Plumber is adding this new cell telling me where I should be loading the data from. So I can just make some changes. Um, maybe add, uh, let's remove this and I can take a look at the data frame and I can save things and you can see that it, it gets updated in the, in the script. And I can just work here and once I'm happy with the results, I just call Plumber build and it runs again. And now I'm going to show that we can do this same thing with functions, which is kind of an experimental feature that uh, we've been working on. Uh, that I think it's, it's, it's great for having this same interactivity with uh, functions. So we have to do Jupyter functions as notebooks. True. And we just open Jupyter notebook again. And we are going to see, you see this new folder? This, this is actually a folder that doesn't exist. You can see here that I just have tasks by but I don't have a folder. This is um, created by Plumber. And you see inside this, I have three notebooks which correspond to each of the functions, get, features, and join. So let's open one of these. So Plumber is doing the same thing uh, that I showed before with the script, but this time with a function. So I'm able to edit this function interactively. And I can, same thing I can do, let's take a look at this data frame, let's save it. And you can see the change here. And sometimes you just want to print like things to take a look at the data, but you don't really want, they are not doing anything for it. And let's say I want to take a look at the data frame, but I don't want this print statement to be part of the function. I just have, a, have to add an empty, empty comment and then Plumber ignores, ignores that part. So this is good for debugging or just adding a few, a few changes to the function. Uh, so this, this has been really useful for me. Uh, I have like some pipelines that have lots of functions that generate features and sometimes they break and I don't know why. So I usually just open this as a notebook and it's much easier for me to go step by step and then say, oh, well, I'm doing this transformation which isn't producing the output that I want in the shape that I want. So that's why the next uh, transformation is breaking. So now once we have this, um, these tools that, I, uh, that I've been working on in Plumber are really focused on having a great development environment so you can focus on the actual analysis and not worrying about deployment. So one, one important thing is to show the interactive console because pipelines are really hard to develop. And especially when you start having like dozens of tasks, you may have some dependencies that break or you may not realize that you should be adding some extra dependency. So if we do Plumber interact, this is going to start a Python session with a special variable called DAG. 
And this is actually the Python representation of our pipeline. So this pipeline YAML file becomes a Python object and we can explore the object, like get the, the, the tasks. You can see get, fit or join, fit, which are the same things that I have here. And I can do, I can get a single task and say, give me the features task and say task. And then I can take a look at the upstream dependencies and say, well, this, does this look good? Yeah, it looks like it's working, right? We have get as part of the dependencies of features. I can also say, where's the source code? Now I can see that this is using a function which is declared here. And one, one important thing here is that I can also start a debugging session. Let's say this task is not working. So I want to use the debugger. I just do task debug. And then I start a debugging session. I can just do next, next. And this is really useful when things break and uh, the, de de the de debugger helps you a lot to really understand what's going on. Especially when you have lar large data frames, you are doing a lot of joins. Just going step by step is, is very useful. Um, okay, so one last thing. This is this covers the basics of Bloomberg and the development part. How you how do you how you go about developing a pipeline, structuring, like adding tasks, debugging. The next important stage is how do we take things to production, right? And this is something very important because uh, at some point, if we are doing some analysis, we have to run. Let's say we are working on a machine learning project and we deploy and at some point we wanna be running the pipeline that we have, let's say every week. We want to score all customers, all users every week and save the predictions to a database or just send a, send a report with some charts. Bloomberg is mainly focused on giving a great development experience and we, we don't want to worry about deployment because that has lots of considerations. So instead of, it, instead of building our own production tool, we leverage other existing tools. For example, Airflow. I mentioned that Airflow has, it has like a really steep learning curve, but it has great features for deployment. So one of the things that we can do is we install another package that we are working on, which is called Supervisor. And same idea, if you follow certain folder layout structure for your project, uh, and this is all in the documentation, you can simply do Supervisor export. Airflow. And this is going to take your source code and produce a, a file, a, a, an Airflow tag. So it should be here. That's here. So this produces a file that converts the Plumber pipeline into a, a, an Airflow pipeline. So you need two things. You need this uh, script plus your source code, which declares the actual transformations that you want to perform. So another uh, thing, another tool that we can use for deployment is called Argo, uh, which I'm going to show right now. So Argo is, is a great tool that allows you, it's kind of an, it is, you can think of it as an airflow for Kubernetes. It allows you to create pipelines and run them uh, in Kubernetes. And the way it works is that you have to specify your pipeline, similar to Plumber. You have to specify your pipeline in a YAML file, except you cannot specify a function. You have to specify like Kubernetes things, like the, which image you want to use, and how do you want to run your, your task and lots of different things that get complicated. So what we do is that if we do supervisor, supervisor export, this is going to generate the YAML file that then we can submit to Argo. So actually I'm gonna open this uh, Argo YAML. And this is, uh, if we submit this to Argo along with the source code, then we are going to be able to, to run this on Kubernetes. So the idea is to lower the technical barrier for data scientists to run their pipelines in production settings. Because most of the time when you have a pipeline and and, and you want to deploy, you have to start thinking in terms of Docker containers and configuration and how do I um, pass data between tasks and, and how do I make sure that all dependencies are installed. So that just creates a big overhead for data scientists, which should be really focusing on the analysis, not on, on managing an orchestration or really understanding how Kubernetes works. So that's the idea. If you follow certain conventions, uh, you can get your pipeline running in a production system. And 
And that's it for the presentation. So I think we can, can start. Well, uh, just one last thing, uh, just general information about the project. If, if you like this and if you wanna see how, how the development and new features are, are going on, uh, please give us a start on GitHub. If you wanna try it, you can do pip install. And I'm looking for early adopters. So if you are interested, if you feel like Moonberry is a, is a, is a good project that you can use and can benefit you in, in your projects, feel free to reach out. And finally, if you wanna see more complex examples, I only uh, talk about like the most basic features. There's also support for R and SQL. So feel free to um, see this repo and then you're going to see some like ETL examples using SQL, some R examples, some more complex examples using the Python API, which has like a, a larger, uh, a big learning curve. Well, at least a little bit more than this JAML thing, uh, but it has a lot of flexibility and it helps you to, to do some, some interesting things. Uh, so that's it. I think we can move to the next section uh, for the questions. Yeah, thank you so much. This this talk was excellent. I, I wish I did. Uh, yeah, everybody give uh, Eduardo a round of applause. Um, I know about two thirds of this or half of this group is not in our Slack. Um, if you're looking to join Slack, it's bit.ly slash BOSDS Slack. Um, and uh, I threw a couple links from, from your slides, Eduardo, into the Slack. I know, I don't know if you're in our Slack either, but, uh, and no, uh, since we don't, since we don't have the um, ability to use Zoom's chat, uh, we, go to Slack, but it's nice because all those messages stay there anyway. So um, if anybody would like to ask an initial question, uh, feel free to unmute or raise your hand. Otherwise I'll put awkward pauses in and then throw random questions in between. I have a question, Eduardo. You mm -hmm. mentioned that um, it saves scripts as, as Jupyter Notebooks. And I wondered um, how, like, so, a couple questions. How does that work if you're version controlling with Git? Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, like, you know, it's kind of a, a mess to do that because a lot of the, um, you know, metadata around it changes. And uh, another question is one of our kind of pain points um, with notebooks is that they contain um, some sensitive information. And so if we need to make sure that there's no sensitive information in our in our source code, um, we have decided not to allow notebooks in our source code um, and we store those separately. Um, so in that case is, um, yeah, does this kind of like save those notebooks and Git, does it like not do that? And I got confused with kind of what you said earlier. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, and it's a great, great point that you have. And really, uh, I think there's, we can treat the scripts and notebooks as two different concepts. So your scripts are, are part of your source code, right? Your pipeline. And then you can consider the notebook as an artifact. That, and now oh, so it puts it in a pipeline. different location. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. So then, then you get to decide, well, I want to store, since the scripts are part of my source code, I'm gonna use um, save those on Git, but maybe I don't want to save the notebooks, the output not notebooks in source control. So that's something that you can do, it, it's up to you. And then for sensitive information, I think um, it's it's really out of the scope of the tool, but I would think that you could implement some logic where you run the pipeline and then analyze the output notebook and check, like maybe run some script on top of it to check for, for passwords and that kind of things. I did this in the past for, for an unrelated project uh, where I have a function that, so you pass a, a notebook and then it goes cell by cell with running some, um, some scripts to try to see if there's like a password variable or something that looks like a password, that, that kind of thing. Great, thanks. So I've got a, uh, I feel like Sarah and I probably shouldn't hop back and forth questions, but I, I have a question, so. Um, where I work, we have recently deployed both Prefect and Argo workflows. Um, in the past, there was an Airflow POC, and uh, before that, everything was in Jenkins EMR jobs. Um, I uh, didn't have a chance before the meetup, before your talk, to really explore Plumer, but as I was reading through some of your blog posts, I noticed you have a really great summary of different workflow management tools, which is awesome. Um, I also noticed Argo workflows is mentioned in the summary, but is not one of the workflow tools at the top level, which was a little meta there. Uh, how yeah. do you decide if you have multiple workflow management tools? 
which to use or specifically I'm trying to understand the differences between when I might put things in Argo workflows versus prefix. Yeah, sure. So I think, so the reason, the reason why I have Airflow but not Argo as part of the blog post is really more, I, I feel like both Airflow and Argo are like production tools, like things that most people shouldn't touch, like only people who are experts in either Argo or, or Airflow should be like using. And then you have some other tools that convert to Airflow or Argo. Now I, I have Airflow there because it's really the most popular workflow manager. And I feel like lots of data scientists are using and I advocate for like not, not going to the details with Airflow because it's really hard to get it right. And it dis dis distracts you from uh, actually doing your analysis. And that was my experience a few years ago. Um, and Argo, I think that's a great framework to build things on top of. Like if you have some really specific use case, Bloomer is not going to work because Bloomer has like some template that you have to fill and then it converts to Argo, but it doesn't give you the full power that Argo has, right? So I feel like there's gonna be some use cases like data science pipelines where you have more developer or data science uh, friendly uh, environment for the users and then you leverage these uh, production tools. Uh, but it really, if you have like a, a specific use case where, when you really have to leverage a lot of really specific features in Argo, you should be using Argo directly. I think it depends on, on, on your project. And also to be honest, I don't feel like we have reached a point where we have some like really organized structure and taxonomy of, of workflow orchestrators. And most tools are in the middle of like being developer friendly or more for like engineers. So it's still a bit of a bit difficult to decide which is the best tool for the job. Yeah, we're moving several of our um, Argo CD deployed Kubernetes cron jobs into Argo workflows. Um, uh, and a lot of those things are like, because I work as a site reliability engineer on more of a production side of things, you know, run this retirement job once a day or once an hour or something like that. And, I think that lines up with what you mentioned versus the prefect um, flows, because they don't call them jobs, they a different vocabulary, mm -hmm. um, have a lot more of a data centric approach. And there's a lot of reporting that's available to our edX, ed ed our data engineering team to sort of investigate what's going on with those flows and what's broken because uh, the source data is less clean and, and sometimes results in more, more of a requirement for troubleshooting. So um, super interested to see if uh, Plumer will be uh, useful in, in our context. Yeah, if you have like some use case or you want to get more details, just let me know. Can I ask a question? Yep, go for it. So how does this align with a data governance at the beginning you talked about maintenance and so forth and, and inline documentation and so forth is so important. How does this align with a data governance program um, and maintenance overall of, of one's code or does it or am i thinking outside and the box where i shouldn't be no i think i think it's a great question that's a great point and, and unfortunately i didn't have time to show that feature but there's uh, something called uh, hooks in in in, in plumber which are things that you want to run after certain task runs and i think that fits well with your uh, data governance question because if you use uh, Plumber to develop some pipelines, you want to make sure that at each stage you are producing some output that has certain properties, right? If you are analyzing, let's say, um, users data, you might expect that a table that has the name users shouldn't have any duplicated IDs, right? So you may have a test. Once you run your pipeline, your, your task that cleans the users table, you want to check, run some checks like, check for duplicate IDs or check that dates are within certain ranges. Uh, so I think that's that's one, um, one aspect where, where you could apply um, data governance that you have certain rules, certain tests. And if your pipeline runs, but those tests fail, uh, then it shouldn't be taken to production. Kind of like build okay. it into the pipeline. Yeah. That's cool. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, it, it does. And obviously inline comments, Python, obviously like every language has the ability to throw comments in there. I didn't know if there's any special places you feel like there should be more 
documentation than others to help others come along and uh and be quite honest take over should somebody leave or you know the proverbial wind powerball because i don't like it hit by a bus <laughs> um and right now would be a great time to win powerball <laughs> yeah i feel i feel like those two things like if you have to start somewhere uh trying to improve data quality having like two sentences like th that describe what you are trying to do with certain tasks two sentences describing it and then having simple tests goes a long way and then on top of that you can apply maybe more strict rules but um, it's really hard to get documentation right because as soon as you change the code documentation is outdated so um, well and that's why i'm a big believer of inline documentation which is when you change your code you do it right away or it doesn't get signed off and go into production um so which is part of governance process as well yeah i'll go ahead and stop the recording in case anyone wants to ask a question but uh didn't want to be recorded <laughs>